All right, guys. Uh, the name of this message is going to be called Nobody Does It Like Angel Lee. <laughs> Nobody Does It Like Angel Lee. And you might be thinking, who the heck is Angel Lee? You know, <laughs> who's that? You know, is there, are they related to Bruce Lee or Jet Lee? Like, what's going, what's going on over here? No, uh, I'm not talking about an actual human being named uh, Angel Lee. Uh, this is actually uh, kind of a joke I made up. Uh, I'm sure it sounds familiar. The slogan sounds familiar. Uh, you're used to hearing it be said, nobody does it like Sarah Lee. So if it sounds familiar to you, that's where it comes from. But for those that don't get it, uh, I remember when I would watch TV a lot, there would be these commercials that would come on, and they would be uh, commercials promoting pies and cakes and stuff like that. And it, and, and the people that made those cakes, the, the name of the company was called Sara Lee. And so at the end of the commercial of showing you all these delicious-looking cakes or pies or whatever, you would hear the little jingle at the end. Nobody does it like Sarah Lee, right? Y'all get it. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Okay, Sarah Lee. Well, what this sermon is going to show you is that really, when it comes to making delicious cakes, nobody does it like Angel Lee, or rather the angel of the Lord. So uh, going to have a little bit of fun with this one. And it'll make sense as I get into scripture. But let me say this. I'm talking to some people in this sermon. And this is what I'm going to say to let you know if this message is probably for you. Are you somebody who maybe over time, over weeks, months, maybe even years, you've gone out of your way to help some people, to be of service to some people. You know, you, you, you've talked to them, you've helped them, you've ministered to them, you've been a blessing to them. You've just really done so much and spread yourself so thin to be helpful to some people that you know God placed in your life to help, to be good to. But over all this time, you feel so low, you feel drained, you feel very used, taken advantage of, and you know you've done the right thing, but you really feel like you're being taken for granted. You really feel like you give and give, and the people you, you sow into, it's like they take and take, but they don't really want to give back. They don't really want to, I guess, acknowledge you in any kind of way. There's no real thank you. There's no... You know what I mean? They're, you know, And it's not that you're doing it to get a thank you or to get a pat on the back, but it'd be nice sometimes to just, you know, kind of feel appreciated here and there. That's all, no big deal. But after all this, you just feel so drained and wore out. Matter of fact, this probably isn't your first go-round feeling this way. But now you're just to the point, this go-round, where maybe you're thinking, you know, God... I'm thankful that, that you know, you, you're using me. I'm thankful to be a vessel of yours. I'm thankful that I, I've been able to have opportunities to help people and be a blessing to people, Lord. And I've done what I can to minister to people. But, Lord, I'm really at a point now, no offense, but I'm, I'm at a point now where I would really love to really give my all to some folks that would really appreciate me giving them my all. I really want to be around some folks that, that would just, you know, uh, encourage me, uplift me the way that I try to uplift them from time to time. It'd be really nice to be good to some folks that when I pour into them, they want to pour into me back some kind of way. Be willing to pray for me. Be willing to show support for me. Not that it's about pleasing people. Because, God, I do it for you, but it would just be nice to not feel like I spread myself so thin for people who really just don't appreciate me and who really just take me for granted. And I just really, I really need some really good friends, really good supporters, really good help. 
You know, I can't do all this alone, and I know you got more for me, God, and I want what you have for me, but I know I'm going to need the right team, the right people backing me up. I really need a true inner circle that will really go all the way with me and not purposely try to hold me down, not purposely try to uh, be a, a false friend, someone who already has it in their mind to be a Judas, to stab me in the back. I don't need uh, any Delilahs, you know, trying to make me weak. I really need real genuine folks, and that would be really nice. And maybe that's what you're thinking. Maybe that's what you're saying, what you've been praying to God about. And if that's the case, maybe, just maybe, this sermon is for you. Nobody does it like Angel Lee. That's what I'm here, what I'm here to tell you, That the title of this, you know. It still tickles me. I'm the one that made it up, but it still tickles me. It's still funny. <laughs> Nobody does it like Angel Lee. I'm here to tell you that, that uh, God and his angels, they got your back, and, and no one can do it like God. The Spirit of God can make a way out of no way for you, and uh, he'll, he'll give you what you need. He can refresh you. He can renew you. He can empower you, strengthen you. And, and that's what this is going to be about. So I'm going to start out here in Judges chapter 6, starting at verse 11. This shouldn't be a very long sermon. But um, starting here in Judges, let me just say what's been going on prior to verse 11 is this. You've got God's people who have been very rebellious towards God. They really haven't tried to do things his way. And so uh, God has removed uh, his, his favor from them, and, and I guess you could say it's like he's kind of backed up from giving them his full protection, and what he's done is he's allowed a people called the Midianites to come in and really just cause trouble for his people as a way to kind of wake them up. And so let's look at what happens here at verse 11. It says, And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak which was in Ophrah that pertained unto Joash, the Abizarite and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And Gideon said unto him, O oh my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen on us? And where be all his miracles which our fathers told of us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. So this angel, the angel of the Lord, has come and gone out of his way to speak to Gideon, a guy named Gideon. And Gideon is saying, you know, I know that we're God's people, but it just seems like we're going through so much right now. I don't understand why we're going through what we're going through. You know, I've been told of how the God, the one true living God, uh, saved our forefathers, saved us from Egypt, took us out of bondage. And so if we're so out of bondage, why are we going through what we're going through now? It feels like the Lord has forsaken us. And God already knew how Gideon was feeling, as well as some others, how they were feeling. And so that's why he comes on the scene, the angel of the Lord, speaking uh, the words of God, letting, basically about to let Gideon know that he's about to work some things out. And this is where you're probably at. You're, you, you've been feeling almost like a Gideon. You're like, God, you know, I, I know I'm being used by you. You know, I know I'm a child of yours, but it just seems like, you know, I'm just wore out. All hell is coming against me. I can't quite get ahead, and I feel like I should be further ahead than where I'm at, and I don't know, it just seems like I'm being held back, or like I'm being punished because of other folks being rebellious, I just don't understand, but let's look at what it says, verse 14, and the Lord looked upon him and said, go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites, have not I sent thee? And he said unto him, O my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? 
Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. And he said unto him, If now I have found grace in thy sight, then show me a sign that thou talkest with me. Depart not hence, I pray thee, until I come unto thee, and bring forth my present, and set it before thee. And he said, I will tarry until thou come again. So what's happened up until this point is Gideon is being uh, shown that God is paying attention and that God is going to help him out. And uh, the angel of the Lord is saying to Gideon, you know, you've been chosen. You've been sent. And Gideon is just like, I, you know, I, I hear what you're saying, but look at my situation. I really don't have much going on for me. My family is poor. I'm the least of my father's house. I'm looked at almost like nothing. I mean, I get it. You know, I'm supposed to be something. I get what you're saying. I'm supposed to be a somebody in the eyes of God, but it seems like around a lot of these folks, I'm just nothing. I just don't know what I can do to really make a difference. But let's see what's going to happen. Verse 16, it said, And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one. I need you to understand whoever this is for. God is with you. You got to understand, yes, it gets tough when it seems like uh, you got a lot of people that are not going to be with you, and some people that uh, they start out with you and then they leave, or... They start out with you and they stab you in the back or you thought they were with you, but they're really not. Or maybe you were tagging along with some folks and you thought they would be beneficial to you, but really they were just seeing how they could benefit from you. And when they felt like they got all that they could out of you and they uh, dried you out, if that's how you want to put it, left you malnourished. That's what they did was they left you high and dry and kind of went on their own way. But God is always with you. He won't leave you nor forsake you. Even when others do, in fact, all that does is uh, pushes the hand of God to help you more when you're out there in it alone, really. But again, verse 17, and he said unto him, If now I have found grace in thy sight, then show me a sign that thou talkest with me. Yes, whoever this may be for, yes, you have found grace in his sight. And it's not that God doesn't want to give his grace to any and everybody, but the thing about it, whoever this is for, is you've really sought God with your whole heart. That has made a huge difference between you and others. You got a lot of people that they seek God, but not with their whole heart. They only want to get what they can out of God. But you have a grace and a mercy that's just undeniable, following you around, all because you have sought God with your whole heart, and you've admitted, you know, I can't do this on my own. I need help. I don't want to try to control this or manipulate this to go how I think or how I feel it should go. I want to do this your way, God. So even when you mess up and you screw up, it seems like you have this way of bouncing back faster than it seems like others do. It's because of that grace and that mercy that's surrounding you. So again, verse 18, depart not hence, I pray thee, until I come unto thee and bring forth my present and set it before thee. And he said, I will tarry until thou come again. Verse 19, and Gideon went in and made ready a kid and unleavened cakes. Here we are with the cakes. And unleavened cakes of an ephah of flour, the flesh he put in a basket, and he put the broth in a pot and brought it out unto him under the oak and presented it. And the angel of, of God said unto him, take the flesh and the unleavened cakes, and lay them upon this rock, and pour out the broth. And he did so. 
So a, a, a little bit of a cake is being prepared here. And the angel of the Lord is showing them how to put this cake together. Almost like if, if you're watching some uh, TV show where they show you how to cook some stuff up, like you're watching Emerald Live or you're watching Martha Stewart. They're showing you how to put this together. The angel of the Lord is like, okay, you know, take, take this and, you know, take this flesh and take this unleavened cake and do this set it on this rock do this do that you know mixing it all up <laughs> verse 21 then the angel of the lord put forth the end of the staff that was in his hand and touched the flesh and the unleavened cakes and there rose up fire out of the rock and consumed the flesh and the unleavened cakes then the angel of the lord departed out of his sight and when Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord, Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for because I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face, and the Lord said unto him, Peace be unto thee, fear not, thou shalt not die. Then Gideon built an altar there unto the Lord and called it Jehovah Shalom. Unto this day it is yet in Ophrah of the Abizarites. And it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Take thy father's young bullock, even the second bullock of seven years old, and throw down the altar of Baal that thy father hath, and cut down the grove that is by it. So he's made this cake, and the angel consumes, causes uh, this, this cake, to be consumed and then Gideon understands that he has been visited by an angel and the Lord speaks to him and lets him know uh, what I need you to do is to tear down the altar of Baal this God that has been worshiped tear down this idol yes your fathers made this idol but tear it down choose me over everyone and everything else tear down these idols basically what i want you to get out of this is this right here first of all like i said you've been kind of like gideon you've gotten to this point where you're thinking i don't understand this what do i do i i, I need some help here and it's almost like you've been shown okay this is what you've done just like how the angel told him to prepare this cake it's like God is saying okay this is what you've done you've you've made these quote-unquote cakes so to speak being symbolic here in other words you fed people you've helped people you've nourished people and now you're thinking what about me and what it's like God is doing is he's, it's like he's saying, okay, this is going to be your ultimate cake mix right here. I'm a Martha Stewart this. I'm going to Sarah Lee this out. I'm going to help you with this final cake, so to speak, that you're going to use to minister to some folks. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to prepare you for you to be nourished for you to be fed for you to be helped in other words it's time to take a moment to pause from your cake making skills if you will to really help and nourish yourself it's a time for you to be nourished and for you to be taken care of and yeah, listen in other words it's a time for you to be fed yourself and in order to be fed simply put stay in my word continue to stay in it get in it more than what you have been stay in my word get fed be more concerned about feeding yourself right now so get fed i'm going to give you rest because you've been wore out you've been doing all these things the enemy has been doing all he can to keep you wore out and wore down and tired and not having your energy and not having your strength and not having your joy because the, my joy the joy of the lord is your strength and your help so he's been trying to get all this out of you the enemy has and right now i just want you to be fed i want you to get rested and in the meantime i want you to prepare yourself 
for what it is that I'm about to do for you. You've done things for others, but right now I want you to prepare yourself for what I have in store for you. And it's almost as if God is saying, I'm getting ready to use you, Gideon, to tear down the altars that others have made. In other words, I'm going to use you to push over these idols, these false gods that people have chosen over me. Gideon, you've chosen me, and now I'm going to use you to get others to help others open their eyes up and realize that they have forgotten their first love. Not to say that there are people that don't love me, not to say that there are people that don't serve me, but the key word being first. I'm not the first love of a lot of people right now. And I can use you to knock down altars for false gods, so to speak, to get people on the right track with me again. I want to use what you've gone through in your testimony to wake people up to what they're doing or what they are not doing that they should be doing, which is making me number one over anyone and anything else. And I can use you to bring glory to my name. Go with me to first Kings chapter 19. I won't dig too far into this because I've gone over this so many times, the story of uh, what happened in chapter 18 of first Kings, where you have uh, Elijah, the prophet Elijah, who had a huge victory on Mount Carmel when he calls people out and he says, okay, how long will you guys be caught between two opinions? Will you serve the one true God or do you want to continue to worship Baal and sit at the table of, of Jezebel and her prophets? What do you want to do? You've got to pick. You can't ride the fence. And, and the people that were trying to choose the enemy side, they called unto their God. They didn't get a response. Elijah calls unto the Lord. Fire comes down from heaven. It's, it's a, a, an amazing thing. And so he has this huge victory. It was something to wake up the eyes of the people to show them the mistake that they had made of turning their back from God or trying to uh, rot the fence with him. And let's look at what happens after that here in chapter 19. It says this at the beginning, And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword, then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, Let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life, as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life, and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat under a juniper tree and he requested for himself that he might die and said it is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life for I am not better than my father's. And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. We have Elijah, he's, he's been hard at it. He's been busy, busy. And now he's at a place, almost, I guess you could say, of exhaustion. He's hiding out under this juniper tree, seeking rest. And as he's laying under this tree, he gets to be touched by an angel, as they would say. And the angel tells him to arise and eat. And this right here, for whoever this is for, this right here is like a moment where you can say the tables turn a little bit for your favor to help you out. You've been one, like I said, to feed others the cakes, but now the angel is coming to you saying, it's your turn to arise and eat. It's your turn to rest, and it's your turn to eat and be fed and nourished, and it's your turn to take the time to get ready to prepare for what is in store for you because you were 
a servant unto the Lord when others who should have been weren't. Let's look at this. He said, Arise and eat. Verse 6, And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baking on the coals and a cruise of water at his head, and he did eat and drink and laid him down again. So he was asleep. He was resting. The angel says, Arise and eat. And so he ate and he drank. He had him a, not a Sara Lee, but an angel Lee cake. <laughs> he had him an angel Lee pie and uh, uh, has, had him some water, or as we would do in the South. He had a slice of pie and some sweet tea, <laughs> right? <laughs> and uh, after that, he laid back down and uh, got some more rest. Verse 7, and the angel of the Lord came again the second time. And touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. In other words, he's letting them know you got some things ahead of you. It's a, it's a, it's a big journey, but right now, you got you to gotta be ready. You got to rest. You got to eat. You got to prepare. So he eats again. Verse 8, And he arose and did eat and drink, and went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights unto Horeb, the mount of God. And he came thither unto a cave and lodged there, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I, only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the lord and behold the lord passed by and a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the lord but the wind was not or sorry but the lord was not in the wind and after the wind an earthquake but the lord was not in the earthquake and after the earthquake a fire but the lord was not in the fire and after the fire a still small voice Elijah had rested and gotten fed and now he's at a point where he's trying to hear from the Lord and he has secluded himself gotten away from everybody else and he's at this cave and he's trying to hear from the Lord and all these different things happen the winds of the earthquake uh, and and the fire and all these things happening but out of all the things all these events all of these uh, things of nature happening he is not in it God is in a still small voice whoever this is for just make sure you take the time to have a little bit of silence. You know, you may be at a point where you're tired of feeling alone, where you're tired of when, when it seems like you do have some good company, maybe they're bad company or they're miserable and they're just around because they think misery loves company. And so <laughs> you keep having to either watch people leave your life or you keep having to, you know, detach yourself from some folks, but you keep finding yourself alone. But take this time to just enjoy the alone time if you will enjoy the silence spend some time in some quietness because when you get past all the commotion when you get past all the chaos when you get past all the distractions and the sounds and the bells and whistles and you get into that quiet place it'll make it easier for you to hear what it is that the Lord is saying to you enjoy the peace and the rest stay in the word stay fed and have the ears to hear and the heart to receive what the Lord may be saying to you in this hour go with me to Acts chapter 10 Acts chapter 10 We'll start at verse 9. Now, what has happened in this chapter up until this point is there's a guy named Cornelius. God has sent an angel to minister to him. 
to tell him to go and visit this guy named Peter. And so let's look at what's going on here in verse 9 with Peter. It says, On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry and would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened and a certain vessel descending unto him as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed that call not thou common? What's going on here is this. This, of course, is New Testament. But way back, if you backtrack in the Old Testament, you had all these laws, and there were certain types of animals that you couldn't eat. You weren't supposed to eat them because they were considered by the law unclean, something ritualistically unclean. If you were one who served the Lord, you were a child of God, you just didn't eat certain things. And here we are, New Testament, some things have happened. Jesus, he has come and died for our sins, and he has fulfilled the law. And here we have Peter, ready for something to eat, but spending time seeking the Lord in prayer, putting his flesh aside, in other words, you know, how he feels, his hunger, putting it aside to pray and hear what the Lord might have to say unto him. And the Lord tells him, to rise and kill and eat, he sees in this vision a vessel sending this sheet his way, coming down from heaven. And in this sheet are these images of these different animals. And so when he hears the voice of the Lord from the angel of the Lord saying, rise, kill and eat, Peter has this reaction of, wait a minute, hold on, what's going on here? I, I can't eat this. These are all things called unclean. I haven't eaten any of this, so I don't think it's a good time to start. But God is trying to reveal to him that we're past that point. He's trying to do a new thing, if you will. And he's saying what it is that I now call clean. Don't call it unclean. If I give you the thumbs up, to partake of something, to have something, you are more than welcome to have it regardless of what past laws and truths, quote unquote truths, and traditions have said. It's not about what man's going to have to say about what you eat. It's about what I say. And so I use that to say this. Here's another moment where the Lord is trying to speak to someone about eating but I want to use this symbolically to represent something. As I've said before, not only is it important for you to eat spiritually by being in the word, but I also want to use what happened here in this story to say this for whoever this may be for. This is a time now where you're getting ready to walk into what is your greater. You're getting ready to walk into uh, your suddenly. Things will suddenly begin to happen. It's like the, 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 the windows of heaven are opening around you and things are falling down to you. Open up the floodgates of heaven and pour us out a blessing. That's what we say, right, when we pray to God. And that's kind of like what God was showing them. I'm opening up the heavens and pouring out something onto you, things that you didn't expect, things that you didn't see coming, just like how he would have never thought the animals that he considered to be unclean would be shown to him in an image from God. 
God is wanting to give things to you, things that you've wanted, things you needed, but things you never even saw coming. He has things for you. But the thing is, you can't get wrapped up in man-made traditions. You can't get wrapped up in things that are done away with. You can't look at the past and say, well, if I partake of these things, people are going to judge me. They're going to call me unclean. They're going to call me this. They're going to call me that. Yeah, I know that it's something that God's trying to give to me, but, 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 but you got to understand people are going to look at this funny. They're going to look at it a certain way. And whoever this is for, listen, whatever God shows you, reveals to you that he has for you, do not be concerned at all with what the opinions of man are. Don't, don't listen. Don't be concerned about past traditions. Don't be concerned about people trying to pull, you know, uh, verses from uh, the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, where they, they go back and they want to look at all these thou shalt and thou shall nots, many of which they don't follow because they get that the law has been fulfilled, but they want to pull scripture out to hold against you. That, but, but they don't want to hold themselves to that old school standard. Come on. You're going to come across some folks that when God gets ready to bless you and give you what he has for you, you're going to have some naysayers say, oh, no, you cannot have that. You cannot partake of that. We're going to look at you as, as terrible, as unclean, as sinful. We're going to have all kinds of negative things to say to you and about you if you partake of what it is that you're saying God has for you. But listen, don't worry about it. What God says is clean, don't call it unclean anymore. Whatever he has for you is yours. Take it. Let's look. Last couple of verses I want to read out of this. It says in verse 16 and 17, this was done thrice and the vessel was received up again into heaven. So this image, this, this moment has happened three times. Now while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, behold the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. Peter right now is at a point where he's, 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 he's starting to let doubt creep in. He's doubting and saying, I don't know, does this, does this image that I just had, this vision, was it, was it for real? Uh, did God really say that? Does this mean what I really think it means? Is this for real? Yes, it's for real. Do not doubt what God is showing you. But we see during this time that he's, he's having a little bit of a doubt. He's a little bit unsure. But then right during the time that he's having a little bit of uncertainty, the men that were sent to come talk to him from Cornelius, there they are. They're standing outside of the gate. And they're getting ready to inform Peter, hey, we were sent because of the vision that God gave, that the angel of the Lord gave to Cornelius. In other words, at a time where he's doubting what God is showing him, right at the gate, right outside, he's got some people getting ready to visit with him to let him know, hey, it's not just you out here seeing stuff. It's not just you out here having visions Okay, you're not the only one trapped in an episode of That's So Raven where we're having visions and seeing the future. <laughs> you're not the only one having the vision, okay? <laughs> That's so raven. Okay, I'm done. I'm, let, let me calm down. Anyway, <laughs> some of y'all know the show That's So Raven, but anyway, whatever. But he's saying it's not just you. You know, it's not just all in your head. What you saw was right. What God has for you is for you. And let me say that to, to whoever this is for, whatever God has for you is for you. Finally, the last place I want to take you is Psalms chapter 23. Pretty, pretty popular text. And it says this, 
verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Whoever this is for, you've gone through some things. You've gone through some tough times. You've been rejected. You've been let down. You've been lied to. You've been lied on. But through all the things that you went through, you have seen that the Lord is your shepherd. He is the one to lead you and guide you. You have tried to allow others to lead you and some of these people probably just led you around in circles and so you spent time feeling like you're trapped in a wilderness ready to get out you've had people purposely lead you in the wrong direction or try to you've really looked up to a lot of people who purposely let you down who purposely rejected you who purposely gave you this talk to the hand attitude You've really had some rough times with some quote-unquote shepherds, so to speak, some so-called leaders, but you've learned to let the Lord be your shepherd, and you've learned patience so that you shall not want. Verse 2, he maketh me to lie down in green pastures, not he gave you the option. He made you lie down. In other words, he gave you rest. And that's what you're doing right now is going through that time of rest. Colon, he leadeth me beside the still waters. Still waters, not wild, crazy, treacherous waters. You know, you had uh, in the last sermon that I did, I was talking about Jonah. Uh, Jonah, the one that got swallowed up by the whale, he ran from the presence of God and got into this ship, but then all of a sudden there was a tempest and the waters started raging and things started getting crazy and it just seemed like it all kept going downhill for Jonah until he finally submitted unto the Lord. And we also know that in the Gospels you had Peter who was willing to step out of that boat and walk onto the water to walk to Jesus in faith, in this amazing faith. And then sure enough, he started looking around and he started getting nervous and doubting himself. And next thing you know, he starts sinking. Maybe you've had times like that where maybe you've ignored God or ran from God or rebelled a little like Jonah. Or maybe you started out kind of good with some things, but all of a sudden you got scared and you doubted and you started to sink. You've gone through those things. But through all of that that you've gone through, you are learning how to let God lead you to still waters. And you've learned to appreciate it and understand it. Because some of the people that came and went in your life, they came to bring turmoil, they came to bring chaos. And it's almost like that's what that water is representing, that, that wild water, that tempest. Someone always bringing the chaos to the point where you just got used to it. You didn't enjoy it, but you just felt like it is what it is. That's just part of life. But God has shown you that you can rest beside still waters. Verse 3, he restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. You've had some people try, like I said, to lead you in the wrong directions. And in the processes of it, people have drained you. People have really given you hell. They've wore you out. They've really used you and abused you and taken advantage of you. And you've needed to be restored. And that's what you've done is you've learned to allow God to lead you in paths of righteousness, not destruction, like what people would do to you, but paths of righteousness so that he could restore you. He wants to continue to give you even more restoration. Now, he wants to restore the years that the palmer worms and the canker worms and the locusts have eaten up so quickly over time. At the snap of a finger, he could restore it all. Verse 4, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. 
You've had times where you've let fear creep in and you've had to learn that God didn't give you that spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Then it says, colon, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff comfort me. You've gotten to know God the Father and Jesus, and you've also let the Holy Spirit have his way in your life to a point where you've gotten to know him as your comforter. Many times when you've wanted people to hold you and to just love on you and tell you it's going to be all right, there were times where the Spirit of God did that for you. So out of all these things that you've gone through, this is what's about to take place because you've gone through all what was said in verses one through four. Now you're getting ready to look forward to verses five and six. It says, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. What do you do at a table? What do you prepare a table for? A feast. In other words, you think you're feeding yourself now, but you're really about to get your socks knocked off. You're really about to get fed in a big way, right in front of some of the same people who have taken and taken and taken from you. They're going to be the same people that not only see you be blessed, but some of the very things that have been hidden from you, some of the secret things that have not been told to you, but that have been talked about behind closed doors in secret, in private meetings. You're about to have some of the same things kept from you, given to you. And you don't have to look at it as someone doing you a favor and now you owe somebody. No, these are things that should have already been given to you, but it's time for you to get ready to receive what's rightfully yours, a rightful inheritance because of who your father is, the king. You're a child of the most high king. Colon, thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. You're about to receive so much, it's like you won't have room enough to contain it all. In verse 6, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You're getting ready to walk into your greater, a higher level of goodness and mercy that you could have never imagined, and you're getting ready to see the importance you've already seen it to an extent but now you're really getting ready to see the importance of dwelling in the house of the Lord it's like your, your church will be your home you won't want to leave it'll be your everything whoever this is for get ready this is about to be good Continue to have what they call a spirit of expectancy. Continue to expect the unexpectable. Continue to walk in faith. Watch God move. And I just have a, fi I have a feeling about this sermon. I haven't really gotten as loud and as excited as I do in many of my other sermons and jumped and shouted and everything. I've been pretty calm for the most part throughout this sermon. But even though I'm being calm, and it seems like a, such a simple message, I have a feeling that whoever this is for, this is really, really about to get really good for you. All the things that you've gone through, it's time for you to reap of the good, all that good that you sowed, all that's been held up from you. It's time for you to get ready to reap your harvest. This is about to be amazing for you. And even though, of course, I went at this sermon at a goofy angle, talking about nobody does it like Angel Lee, <laughs> I'm sure you can tell the seriousness of this message as well. So with that being said, I'm going to wrap this up. And I'm excited to see 
what God does. Thank you all for listening. Lord, I thank you for this message. I pray that those who need to hear this message, that they would hear it, that they would receive it, and that they would get excited, Lord, that they would have a newfound joy, Lord, that they would grab a hold of a spirit of expectancy, and that they would start believing for miracles, that they would start believing for renewal, restoration, restoration in their health, restoration in their mind, restoration in their finances, restoration in their family life, restoration in their relationships, in their marriage. Lord, praying and believing that people are going to see a huge turnaround almost at a time that they would think not. Lord, I pray that your people would even believe for an outstanding hedge of protection and that your angels are being sent on their behalf to do something for them, that your angels would protect them, guide them, and continue to remind them to eat up, eat the cake, be fed, be merry, rest, and enjoy your happy place. Lord, I give you the honor, the praise, the glory, Father. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen.